Good morning. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, oh look. I tried to shave my face off this morning. I'm running late. Mind you, I don't know if I've got a patient in at 8.45, so I might not be running late, but I probably am. Have you noticed that your staff always book patients in at the most annoying times? Am I going to start bleeding all over the camera? I hope not. If I do, you better let me know. Yeah, so that's just when you do, you know, I mean, you know, you have a whole day. Like, I don't think I've got many people booked in this afternoon. But, I think I have got one person booked in, like at half past four, to pick up a bleaching tray. So this is just like the nature of the beast, you know? Or, uh, when I'm running, you know, if they're trying to fill the morning up, the first thing, the first appointment that goes is at 8.45. So it's not like they could say, you know, oh, don't worry, Jake, just, you know, have a have a lie in, you know, just come in at nine. No, it's 8.45. Anyway, so what? <laughs> you know, it's not the end of the world, is it? It's the, sort of the time sensitivity of the job is, is uh, a weird thing because uh, I am among, I am a type A personality in, in certainly when I'm a consumer, if someone makes an appointment at 12.30, I do expect to be seen very, very close to 12.30. The, uh, there's a guy who's uh, just uh, got an obituary in the Times this morning who was the, the something of Clerkenwell, the mayor of Clerkenwell or the gangster of Clerkenwell or something. He was he was a sort of uh, in London and ran the 60s uh, about the time of the craze and uh, ran, ran Clerkenwell and uh, Hatton Garden area. And uh, he was a stickler for punctuality, you know, in the day, like, as in, if you didn't turn up on time, you got, you got a knife in the back. <laughs> so I'm not that bad, but I, have, I did recently walk out of a hospital appointment in London because they were running over an hour late and I'd spent the whole day getting there and had, was going to have to spend the whole day getting back. So I gave them an hour to see me and then when they hadn't seen me after an hour, then that was it. So, but, you know, it's the, I think, uh, I mean, we do try and run on time, but the mechanics of it, it's never so as simple as you think. Okay, it's never as simple as you think. So for example, let me take a, just a simple example of a patient who's due to be seen at 10.30, right? Now, the thing is, if you run on time, then your patients will generally also run on time. So if your patients are not running on time, it's because you never do. And that's logical if you think about it, because let's say, let's say you go somewhere, let's say, I don't know, you go somewhere like a hospital, and the first thing I do when I go into hospital, is I say, are they running on time? And the receptionists hate this question. They'd rather you just went and sat down and shut up and waited. So then they'll, they'll have an answer ready and the sort of answer they give you tells you what sort of clinic it is. It tells you, uh, you know, what their attitude is towards the doctors running late. And it varies from, uh, you know, yeah, at the moment they're running seven minutes late, which is great because it's a, a, it's a sort of, it gives you an idea that whoever's running the clinic in charge of the clinic has really got their finger on the pulse and and cares about running on time and, and that's exactly the answer you want. Yeah, they're running 8.9 minutes late. Or the worst uh, answer you can get is, uh, yeah, I think uh, at the moment they are, they are running a bit late, but have a seat and uh, they'll see as soon as they can. And what that means is that they, the appointments are out of control, completely out of control. And not only that, it implies that the receptionist is in complete sympathy with the practitioner against you. They see the practitioner as the person who's struggling, who's, who's having to deal with the weight, the, the massive workload, the, the overwork that's been imposed upon them by the system of the patients who are the problem, the patient, the excess patients that they're being asked to see. They're, they're clogging up the system and, and, and causing everything to run improperly and you're you know you can 
sometimes get somewhere with some receptionists but a lot of them they just won't they're not on your side at all you know they're just like oh yeah or, or even worse they just lie to you they say something like yeah um, they're running 20 minutes late and then they don't they expect you just to sit down and shut up they don't expect you like 20 minutes later to get up and say to them like you know okay it's 25 minutes now has that changed you know has the, the are they running more late now or what or, or am I going to go in any minute now the last thing they want is to end up in a you know with a constant procession of patients saying are we nearly there yet are we nearly there yet uh, and unfortunately so many of them just uh, you know ignore or fudge or work around the subject but if you run on time what happens is uh, and my, my point was that I mean if you go somewhere and they consistently run half an hour late then what's going to happen is that you're going to sort of start turning up 25 minutes after your appointment time aren't you and then, but they don't like that, oh no, because if you turn up 25 minutes after your appointment time, they'll be like, well, you know, even you're, you're gonna start to be the problem, aren't you? You're gonna lay yourself open to the allegation that it's you that, that they're running late because the patients turn up late, even though they might still be running half an hour late. If you're 25 minutes late, then you're, you're at fault and they're not. So if you run on time, then your patients will turn up on time. And in, because we do run pretty much to the minute, then the patients turn up to the minute. And that actually is incredibly frustrating because you get like this 10.30 patient and they'll say, and I'll say like, is our 10.30 patient here yet? And they'll say, no, it's like it'll be 10.29. And the 10.30 patient won't be here. And then because everybody's got an atomic clock, haven't they now on their wrist? Or everyone's got an atomic clock on their watch, uh, on their phone. So, so, uh, and they've got GPS now and Google Maps and so you know they can say uh, you're, you're going to be at the dentist at 10.28 if you leave in three minutes you'll get there at 10.28 Allow, even allowing for traffic even allowing for traffic you know this is all taken into consideration so they start this journey at the last possible minute which is great for them because it maximizes their productivity because they can keep working till the last minute then they get in the car they, they tip up in the car park two minutes to walk through the building and sit down and they're bang on time and they and they love this this is great for them because they also know that although we've got free high-speed Wi-Fi and to tea and coffee in the newspapers and that chances are they'll be seen within a few minutes and it's like a connecting train you know it's like it's a brilliant connection they go they go car car park walk in sit down door opens in they go it's a, it's a seamless service which they love and waste no time but the trouble is, if, um, you know, I won't, for example, routinely start reading the patient's notes until I know they're here. And I always read the patient's notes before they come in. Um, I always look at their x-rays and I always read my notes from the last couple of visits and just so that I'm completely in the, the groove of where, where I am with them, you know, so that I can because the patients expect you to take up the conversation exactly where they left it off. Because they can remember, they've only got one dentist. They don't realize you've got like 2,000 patients. They've only got one dentist. And so they remember, you know, possibly the last thing that they were talking about, whether it was their, their daughters getting married in Cyprus or they're about to go on an Arctic cruise or something. They, because they don't, you know, and again, in a lot of surgeries, they don't get a chance to connect with the dentist. They don't, they never talk about their dogs with a dentist normally. And so when they come to a dentist who is, who is quite perhaps, uh, you know, a bit more, wants to know them on a personal level, you know, this is the first time they really they're sort of connected with a medical professional sometimes. And uh, it helps them accept my advice and my treatment. Uh, but it also means that, um, uh, you know, if they, <laughs> if they tell me, if they tell me that like they collect, uh, uh, Superman comics or something then uh, you know or, or they tell me uh, just to use a simple example you know if they if we talk about what they do for a living they're not going to appreciate it if on the second visit I then say to them oh yeah um, by the way what do you do for a living they're gonna be like well you know I thought I thought we had a thing but we don't obviously you know you're just you know so the, you like to have some continuity and it's impossible and some of the patients you will remember what they do but a lot of the patients it is impossible to remember I think the thing is to have one 
thing, you know, one or the most two things that are, are the, the essence of that patient, you know, and sometimes you can remember that. Uh, and, I mean, if it is particularly interesting, you do remember it, but if it's not, then, for goodness sake, make a note on their notes, make a pop-up, if you can, that comes up right at the beginning, when you start looking at their notes, that says, this patient is, uh, you know, restores old VW camper vans, that's their life, you know, and then every weekend they go somewhere in their VW camper van, and once a year, they, they, all their family comes over and they take out the entire collection of VW camper vans and, and drive around France and holiday in France as a family. <coughs> because then, you know, it's so much, there's so much goodwill generated just by saying to that person, how, how was your holiday this year, you know, within all the, the old VWs. <laughs> That's, it's, I'm not saying that you're, it's not artifice, really, you're just using it to remind yourself of this, because I remember the conversations I've had, but I do, I can't, I don't have them all in my head, I have to be prompted, um, you know, you, you have to have someone say to you, like, you know, you remember, uh, this is a woman who's uh, like a lab technician who, uh, who nearly blew up all the kids in the lab last time, you know, that funny story about nearly blowing up all the kids, so, anyway, what I do, I like to read all the notes, so, um, and as I say, I like to, what I do, and I highlight it in red, or I have a pop-up, anything that is really crucial, fundamental to the next visit. So, for example, we had a guy in yesterday, he's been in probably three times, every time he comes in, he's covered in plaque, I tell him to stop using an electric brush, because it's useless, for him, it's useless, and, uh, that uh, he's not brushing his teeth properly. And he he's, no, I brush my teeth in an electric brush, I must be brushing it properly, there must be another problem, which we can never, and I can't tell him what the other problem is. He can't tell, he doesn't read it back. With him, with some, with people with oral hygiene, some people, you just tell them and they go, oh my God, why didn't somebody tell me that years ago? And most people, you tell them and you get quite a decent improvement, perhaps a bit of a relapse sometimes, but, in general, you're sort of working, working, working with them. You know, you get a big improvement and then you just work on honing their improvement till they're Olympic standard. And then uh, with guys like him, it takes uh, like, it's like bashing them over the head with a wooden mallet. It takes three or four visits before they they realize that something's going on, you know, <laughs> something occurring outside their cranium. <laughs> so. Yesterday it was great because I, you know, I finally uh, managed to get it through to him that uh, that the fact that and, and they have to. I think what happens is that because we take photographs and we compare, we can show them the photographs of them the last time they came and the time before, so they can see for themselves whether they're getting better or worse, and whether you tell them they're getting better or worse or the same. Nothing beats just printing it out and just saying, look, these two pictures are the top and bottom teeth last time. These two pictures are the top and bottom teeth this time and they will then look at that picture and that as a and that is the witness the picture is the witness and they will then say uh, actually no you actually I think they're they're looking a bit worse and you've got yes that's what I've been telling you for the last 20 years or you know last 20 minutes two years sort of thing anyway so you have one so you have one so so the thing was with this guy the, the key to his visit was was for me to to pick up straight away on this fact that he's got this sort of mental disconnect between um, what he's seeing in his mouth and what he thinks is going on with his brushing. And so you, this is a long-term narrative. You have to pick this up, you know? I mean, this is, as I say, this only works over time, over three or four, five, ten visits. So every time you have to sort of start where you left off last time. Okay, let's stain your teeth up. And I've gotten the note saying like this guy's, uh, you know, he is is a disconnect with his plaque. I mean, he's con he's constantly got a high plaque score, but he doesn't understand how that's related to his brushing. And this time he finally, finally said, you know what? I think I'm going to have to get rid of this electric toothbrush. And I thought, well, if you'd taken my advice, you would have done that on the first visit. But okay, that's fine. It's finally got through into your thick skull that the electric toothbrush is not doing the job for you. You want to try manual brushing, tablets brushing, tablets brushing, tablets brushing, tablets brushing. That's it. Right. 
but I picked this up from his notes. But I didn't start reading his notes until I knew he was here. And then you get this problem that if they arrive on the dot of 10.30, and that's the, so the 10.30 they say, oh, Mr. Sansa's here. So then you have to start, you have to sit down and start reading his notes and looking at his x-rays, etc. Uh, because there's absolutely no point. I mean, I know most of my patients do turn up, so there probably is a point. But really, you know, why should you read everybody's notes when, before you actually know that they are actually at the surgery? But the other, the other side of that is that he's outside, he's got an appointment for 10.30, and, you know, uh, the way it goes, and I know, because I've got this mentality, you know, 10.25, you're fine, okay, 10.28, well, okay, any minute now, 10.29, okay, now I'm waiting for that door to start moving, the last chance to see me early, 10.30, right, now that door should definitely be open by now, or any, any second now, 10.31, disaster, What's, what the hell's happened, you know? What's going on? That 10:31 and no door open, um, and then by 10:35, I'm, 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 you know, I'm like thinking, well, this is what a shoddy operation this is. What's the point of dragging me in here at 10:30, and it's 10:35? Why didn't they ask me in at 10:35? All this goes through your head, and all this goes through the patients' heads as well. <laughs> at least if they're, if you know, if you're trying to keep that bargain up that compact with the patient to, to meet at an agreed time uh, which is is harder for us than they think you know for us to run on time entails making a loss and I know that sounds mad but um, I yesterday I, I uh, had this young girl a lovely girl uh, had a Crohn's disease and said that every time that she her Crohn's disease got worse she has to take immunosuppressive medicine and every time she takes that uh, she gets a, a infection in her tooth it flares up but she said I don't want another root treatment because I had a root treatment and while it worked it cost five visits and I didn't fancy it much etc so so we had when we had a big success with this girl we managed to convince her that if we could do half the root treatment in other words clean this tooth out and dress it and charge her half what we cost you know the cost of the root treatment that she would come back in about two months or something you know and if it's all gone really well seriously consider paying for and having the second half of the root treatment done and because she just came in as a toothache and I was so keen to save this tooth and we and we and I wanted to send her away with a decent dressing and everything so we opened the upper right six up we cleaned it all out we dressed it crescent cotton wool zinc oxide eugenol etc all, all under rubber dam etc and so we ran 15 minutes late and so for us that's that is quite rare and that includes using up the buffer that i normally have between the last patient and and it's the buffer that causes you to make a loss because you're you're um you want to know okay So, so yeah, so you have to run inefficiently. This is the buffer system, isn't it, that causes the technicians to take two weeks to make a, a crown and, and four weeks to make a denture. And as dentists, we have a buffer system in our waiting room. We want to be busy all the time. So we want to have someone waiting so that when we've got any surgery time, as soon as the chair starts to cool down, we want someone else in it to, to maintain the return on capital, you know, to keep the utilisation figures up. But if you're going to run on time, you can't do that. You have the chair has to be empty before the next person comes in. It has to be empty. In fact, it doesn't matter whether it's for a minute, ten minutes, or half an hour. It has to be empty, and so your utilisation figures start to go down. And so that's why, really, uh, probably uh, you can only, as a private practitioner, you, perhaps you find it much easier to run on time than if you're a, a NHS where you can't afford to run with anything less than 100% utilisation. But um, anyway, the thing is, I mean, if you do run on time, and I mean like to within a minute or two, which I'm, uh, at the moment actually it's 8.43, so I'm going to pip squeak in there, aren't I? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screech in, watch that, I'm going to go in that car park, I'm going to do a handbrake turn into a car parking space and fall out of the door into my uniform into the surgery. Watch this. Ready? Here we go. Did you see that? Did you see that? That was amazing. 
Oh God, I bet I couldn't do that again. God, I missed that bloody BMW by that much. That was good fun. All right, all right. did you enjoy that? I'll do that again tomorrow, shall I? No, I won't, I'm gonna do that again. Okay, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.